Firstly, I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional owners of all the land where, wherever we join this seminar from today. For me, participating from Dimboola, Victoria, this is the land of the Wachabolic, Jawa, Jawa, Jali, Wagaya and Jabagog peoples. I would like to extend my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and any elders who may be joining us today. I give recognition to their proud traditions, vibrant culture and continued connection to land, water and community. So we have two wonderful speakers today uh, on the subject of insects. Uh, our first speaker is Dr David Yates, uh, who is an Australian entomologist. He was a Roosevelt postdoctoral fellow at the American Museum of Natural History in New York from 1989 to 92, and was an academic at the University of Queensland from 1994 to 2000. In 2001, he moved to Canberra as a research scientist at CSIRO's Australian National Insect Collection and is now the director. Uh, ANIC, AIC, has 12 million specimens and is the largest collection of Australian insects in the world. He is an adjunct professor at the Australian National University and became the Schlinger Fellow in 2005. With staff, students and colleagues, David studies Australian insects with a particular focus on Australian flies. Um, over to you, David, and welcome. Thanks very much, Laverne. That was a wonderful uh, introduction and uh, it's, it's great to be here um, and thinking about small things and how small things affect our world and how, what a dramatic impact they can have, especially when you think of how small viruses are and what impacts they can have on the world. But insects are, can have big impacts as well. I'm about to share my screen. Let's hope that technology um, works for us. How's that? Can you see my screen, everybody? I'll just um, do the slideshow view. How's that? Yep. Yep, looks fine. You can hear me good. Uh, so I've just got to put a few slides together, really about um, insect population declines. And I'm going to um, uh, segue into the impact that Australia's megafires, the fires that happened last summer, might have had upon in insect populations as well. So we'll start off talking about insect declines and then move into the megafires near the end of the near the end of a presentation. So as Laverne said, I'm the director of the National Institute Collection. There's just a couple of photographs of it here in Canberra. Uh, on the left-hand side is the outside of the building. Um, it, uh, the collection occupies three large halls here in Canberra. Uh, the centre photograph there is our current CEO, Larry Marshall, and I looking at some specimens in the collection. And the photograph on the right is just some um, moths, butterflies and other specimens that we... Uh, store in, I think it's 22,000 drawers that the collection uh, occupies here in uh, on Black Mountain in Canberra. So insect population declines, is it is it a fact or fiction? It's uh, become a very, I guess, a very significant thing in, in, in the public mind. Certainly, certainly at the end of last year, it became quite, uh, quite uh, um, important in the media. And there was a couple of uh, major scientific papers published that uh, address this issue and since then there's been a, a multitude of other studies published addressing um, whether whether insect declines are occurring, the magnitude of the decline and, and the geography of the decline. I'm going to focus really on the on the sort of the paper that was the that set it all off which was published early last year um, and it, um, it uh, really addressed um, and reviewed 70 or 80 other papers that looked at um, insect declines around the world. So they were looking at measures of um, uh, population numbers, so that's the numbers of individuals in populations, their distribution, species distributions, or both of those things in insect populations. Why were they doing that? Why does that matter? They're the first steps that we know about uh, that occur to, to different species when they, they're going towards extinction. They're the sorts of things that happen. Their numbers decline and their, and their distributions decline. 
So these authors looked at 73 reports uh, of, of similar phenomena around the world, really in order to address the causes of those declines. And uh, there's the study there, Sanchez, Bauer and Wikus. Uh, Francisco Sanchez, Bauer actually works in Australia currently. Um, what, they, uh, what they found and reviewed was a lot of evidence from Europe and North America, uh, in fact, very little evidence from Australia. So there's the, the map of the studies that they, that they reviewed, and you can see that the, the majority of those studies were, in fact, in Europe. Um, there were some studies also in the US, but outside the, U the US and Europe, there were very few studies, really. Uh, I'll, summarizing their results very briefly, 38% of the species they looked at were declining, so they were reducing their population numbers or distribution. But they also found a few species uh, increasing, so nearly 20% of species in these studies on average were increasing. So these are often pests or sort of agriculturally enabled in other ways. If they weren't pests, they were, they were, they were fellow travellers with agriculture around the world. The remaining species, so that's, uh, what would it be, another 40% have an uncertain trajectory. So they couldn't really tell whether they were increasing or declining from the data available in those, in those papers. The data from Australia remains sparse, and in fact, in that sanchez Bayer paper, there was only one study that was uh, reviewed, and it really, to my mind, didn't provide much evidence at all. It was a study of, of introduced honeybee hives, which I don't think is a good good um, indicator of, of native species uh, populations. We've, we've um, run some seminars and symposia since that paper was published, like at the end of last year, looking for other data on Australian species, whether they're declining or not. And there, in fact, is very little data that we can, we can glean from, from the Australian scientific literature. There's evidence that um, three species only of Australia's probably 250,000 species of insects are in decline. So there's the three species there. First is the bogong moth. Many of you will be familiar with that species. It, it migrates and estivates in the, in the Alps in summer, and the populations of that species have been monitored for a number of de decades by Ken Green and his colleagues. It seems to be in decline in the Alps especially with the recent drought. Uh, another species that's in de decline is Key's matchstick grasshopper. It's uh, been a rare and threatened species for, for a number of uh, years and its populations have been monitored and it does seem to be in decline. It lives in the, I guess, uh, 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 grassy woodlands on the western slopes of New South Wales and Victoria. Another species is the green carpenter bee, which is a large native carpenter bee um, found in Victoria, South Australia and Kangaroo Island, and it's um, retreated from large parts of its former distribution, and I suspect its populations on Kangaroo Island will have been impacted tremendously by the fires over summer. So there's images of those species, the bogong moth, cute little keys, matchstick grasshopper. It's a little wingless grasshopper uh, that uh, is very well camouflaged, and there's the beautiful green carpenter bee. But of all of Australia's species of insects, they're the only three we could, we could really say we had good evidence of declines. But going back to that global survey, just wanted to focus in on a couple of graphs from that paper that look at the annual rate of decline of, uh, of different uh, groups. So these are looking at uh, three groups, the coleoptera beetles, Hymenoptera, the bees and wasps, Lepidoptera, the moths and butterflies. And the fourth uh, bar graph there is the biomass, just a, just a weight of insects. Um, the annual rate of decline varies among those different groups, but for Coleoptera, it's about 2%, and the same for Lepidoptera, for Hymenoptera, probably about 1%. When you think that's an annual rate, that's, um, that's a huge problem, really, if that's the rate at which they're annually declining. Um, in terms of geographic areas now, this isn't, isn't the taxonomic groups, but geographic areas, Europe on the left, the UK uh, in the middle, then North America and other on the other parts of that group. And 
This is the proportion of insects uh, species declining. And in Europe, it's about 40%. About uh, UK a bit higher. And those other areas are similar. Other parts of the world lower. And that would include Australia, of course. Of course, that far right part of the graph. What's causing the declines? And that's uh, really the, the $64,000 question. If there are declines, what might be causing it? And uh, the studies that uh, uh, Francisco Sanchez Bayo and his colleague reviewed suggested that a large part of the problem was being caused by intensive agriculture there, the blue part of that pie graph, uh, pesticides, which are now being used much more frequently and they're much more potent than they used to be, is uh, accounting for another large fraction of that pie graph. And there are other factors there. Um, urbanization, ecological traits, which really effectively means, I guess, predators and parasites coming in and impacting upon insect, its insect populations. Um, so there are a number of causes there. And you can see, actually, the dark blue part of the graph um, is fires, which only accounts, I think, on that graph for 1.9% um, of that, uh, that decline uh, in that um, study that was published, obviously, before the megafires. So in summary, then, we know that some populations of some insect species have declined in recent decades. But uh, some of the media has sensa sensationalised those, uh, I guess, those papers and really talked about global insect Armageddon. And I can assure you that isn't true. Um, no, some species are, in fact, increasing, as I, as I showed. Um, almost all the evidence we have is from Europe and North America. Almost all the evidence of declines is from areas heavily affected by agriculture and urbanisation for hundreds or thousands of years, if you think of Europe. Uh, there is very little good evidence so far from Australia. Um, however, those, um, those factors that may be causing declines are also occurring in Australia. So if we had good data, good longitudinal data on insect population numbers and distribution going back many decades, we might find more evidence of decline but we don't have it now except for those three species that I mentioned. So in Australia, really, the four main causes of declines are habitat loss, uh, pollution, which we've already touched on a little bit in that other pie graph, those biological factors such as introduced pathogens and other invasive species, climate change and its effects. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about those, uh, those impacting factors on, on insect populations because I know the speaker after me, Dennis Crawford, is going to, going to um, go into much more detail about those in his presentation after this one. Um, now, this is just a, a graphic that really caught my attention from another paper that was published a few years ago. Uh, we really need to understand the huge impact that humans and agriculture are having on the planet. But the, uh, today, of all the mammals on Earth, 96% by weight are livestock and humans, and only 4% are wild animal, wild mammals. Sorry. So we're having a, our footprint on Earth is huge, and our livestock now uh, are a la very large portion of all all mammal biomass on Earth. So when we think about insect population declines, and I think it's a, I think it would be a bad thing. I study insects. I know what important things they do in the environment. But many people wouldn't probably care too much if insects were in decline. They'd probably say, "Great, no more mosquitoes, no more pesky flies, no more ants crawling around in the kitchen." But in fact, it does really matter. Uh, insects and insect populations are really important for maintaining our ecosystems in the, in the way that we like so that we can generate uh, income from those ecosystems. Insects pollinate plants, including many that we rely on for food. That's a really important thing that insects do. Uh, not everyone should remember that insects pollinate the plant that gives us chocolate in particular. If, uh, if you do like chocolate without insects, there'd be no chocolate. Insects decompose plant and animal matter, make it available for other organisms. There are many insects are predators and parasites of other insects. So they basically provide free pest control. Um, 
uh, impacting upon the, the populations of insects that we don't like, that are pests in our homes or on our, in our agricultural landscapes. The other thing that uh, people sometimes forget about that is that insects are food for other animals. That's one of the really important things that insects do. They probably don't like it too much, but they're in fact food for many other animals. For example, 60 or 70 percent of bird species in Australia are insectivorous. So if, if uh, insect populations are in decline, so are your insectivorous bird populations. It uh, follows like night follows day. Uh, some, a US study a few years ago um, estimated that insects contribute $57 billion to the US economy each year, and they'll contribute many, many billions to the Australian economy as well each year if you were to do the, to do the maths on it. One of the real challenges of, of, of studying insects and being an entomologist is that it's really hard to get people excited about conserving insects. We're doing very much about their, about their decline or their popu populations. It's interesting to think why we don't care too much about conserving insects. Um, and maybe there's many people in the audience who do care about conserving in insects, but in my experience, it would be a minority of, of Australians. Um, most pub people are largely unaware of the ecological importance of insects. That goes for policy makers as well. There are many challenges in insect conservation. The, the basic science on insects and other invertebrates is scarce. We often um, don't know where they're, where they're distributed, what they do, what they require to, to live their lives. Most insect spe species in Australia don't even have names. So the collection here in Canberra uh, with 12 million specimens, we probably have 100, 120,000 species here, but there are tens of thousands of them that yet have names, that have not yet been named. We spend quite a bit of our time here um, uh, describing and discovering new species of insects and, and uh, working out their uh, evolutionary histories. Distributions are largely unknown, I've said that already. Um, and most of, most of the time their abundance in space and time is, is poorly understood. So all those things make them difficult to conserve. And we don't really understand what regulates their populations. So one of the important uh, factors about insect populations is they vary quite dramatically from year to year often, and we sometimes don't re really understand well why that is. So I did mention at the start of this presentation that the idea of insect populations declining has become quite a topic of, uh, topic of debate in the scientific literature. There are many, many uh, entomologists who don't believe the data, who don't really believe there's strong population declines of insects around the world. Um, there are many challenges in, in interpreting the kinds of data that are uh, Francisco Sanchez Bayo and his colleague did uh, gather together. Many of those critics have, have said that we really need to gather studies from a wide range of locations, especially in the tropics, to get a better idea of what's happening to in insect populations. We need to account more properly for that high annual variability in insect population numbers. We need to take samples frequently over a long period. And when I say a long period, I mean many decades, you know, four or five decades. Given that most scientific research projects uh, last for three years, um, having a scientific research project that lasts for 50 years is quite a challenge. There are many ways of addressing this, uh, the data you might need to collect for such a study. Do you, would you count species? Would you count the abundance of some of the species? Would you just count the biomass of all the species? Or would you look at the way that species turned over across the, the, uh, across the different uh, decades that you are studying? And all of those things do change when you start to measure insect populations, especially over long time periods. It's actually, while, while many scientists do try to attribute cause to their studies of showing that insect populations are in decline, it's actually very difficult to attribute a cause 
Um, and many impacts are acting simultaneously on, on insect populations. Uh, there was a recent study, um, a review, I suppose, that was, was uh, a, a call to arms for entomologists to study insect populations uh, more, more intensely and really to look more carefully at their data. And, and they presented this um, diagram, which is really a, just a um, hypothetical diagram of of an insect population being measured from the 1970s to 2020, showing some of the problems of in, in interpreting the data. So you can see that that population increased from the 60s up to 1980, then started to decline. So you would get different, uh, different measurements of uh, whether the population was increasing or decreasing, depending on where, where you began to measure the population's uh, uh, numbers, if you like. If you started in the 70s and then measured in, the, in 2020, you'd think they were increasing. But if you started in 1980 and then measured again in 2020, you might think they're decreasing. So that diagram just demonstrates some of the real challenges with uh, measuring insect populations over, over long periods of time and interpreting what those measurements actually mean. I don't want to go into that in too much detail, is it? There's a reference there to, at the bottom if anyone does want to look at that in more detail. Some scientists, I suppose, have got a bit frustrated with the debate and said, um, you know, really, if your house is burning down, you don't need a thermometer. You need the fire brigade. So we don't really need more and more careful measurements of insect populations. We know from uh, what, what's happening in, in many parts of the landscape and in many countries that, that in, uh, insect and other animal populations are being reduced. We don't need to just keep me indefinitely measuring those, uh, those effects. We need to get on and uh, do something about it. And that's uh, a segue now to uh, the fires of last summer, where we had lots of fire brigades around the country working for many months to bring those fires under control. And I really just wanted to... Um, touch on those, those fires for the last few uh, uh, slides of this presentation. But they were, uh, I don't know, for many of us, I think they were tremendously emotionally draining and uh, uh, a dramatic um, aspect of our lives. And, and last summer will live in my memory forever. It was um, just appalling to see the damage that was being done to um, Many forested areas that I have worked in for decades, and uh, and it was just uh, just a really harrowing experience that whole those months of those fires going on. There's a satellite image of the of the smoke um, extending from the fires out into the Pacific Ocean there on the left, and in fact uh, the the smoke was so bad that it impacted New Zealand and South America. Chile in South America also was some. Um, impacted by the smoke from Australia's eucalypt forest burning. How bad were the fires? So um, it's important to realise that they were really, really significantly worse than other fires that we've had. We talk about Australia being in the land of, um, what is it, fires and flooding rains. Well, last, uh, last summer's fires were not normal. The estimates are that 21% of Australia's temperate eucalypt forest burnt last summer. Normally, only about 2% burns, even in bad years, even in, even in drought years or bad years. So it was sort of 10 times worse than other, than other years. And that graph there is really just looking at um, those megafires. And the, the, the last summer's Australian megafires are that dot at the very top of the very left-hand bar. Uh, and the different bars are different parts of the world and how much of their ecosystems burned. Well, Australia, Australia's fires last summer were a huge outlier, not only for Australia, but globally. So the diagram there on the left, the dark, the black parts of that uh, map of, of Eastern Australia are the, are the parts of uh, Australia that burnt, the, the fire grounds. Um, it turns out that there was a, a part of Australia that was as, is as large as England, uh, was consumed by fire last summer. And those panels on the right-hand side there are just some photographs of the devastation of different landscapes. I think the one on the top there is from Kangaroo Island. 
the other two are in the southern highlands here in, in east, southeastern Australia. Um, there were 13 million hectares burnt. Uh, as I've said, the equivalent to the air of England. Uh, 2019 was the hottest and driest year on record, so the fires were a culmination of that very hottest and dry year. Rainfall was 40% lower than average and temperatures were 2% above average for 2019. Those conditions will occur more often in the future, so we shouldn't think that the, the, the mega fires won't happen again. They're likely to happen more, again and more frequently. Just uh, to zoom in on a little part of eastern Australia that uh, was heavily impacted by the, by the fires. Um, this is a little part of uh, the, um, the Gondwana Rainforest National Park system around the Blue Mountains behind, really behind Newcastle there. This contains that, uh, uh, the Wallamai pine, the little tiny population of the Wallamai pine that lives in a gorge in Wallamai National Park. Just a few individuals have, are surviving really from the Mesozoic era in that, in that canyon. And one of the reasons they've survived there is because they've survived fires over millions of years. Um, and there were really heroic efforts made to, uh, to save that population from the fires this last summer. So that, this diagram uh, just gives you the uh, World Heritage Areas burnt in yellow, the World Heritage Areas that were not burnt this last summer in green, and the, the grey areas are the other parts of the landscape that burnt but don't happen to be World Heritage Areas. So really what's happening is not only the eucalypt forests are burning, but also the rainfor the, the rainforests are now so dry that the fires are driving into the edge of rainforests. And those plant species, again, they're, they're very ancient plants, many of our rainforest uh, trees, they don't have the ability to cope with fire nearly as well as eucalypt forests do. And in many, many times, they're irre irrevocably changed once a fire gets into rainforest habitats. Often they'll be converted to eucalypt forest or otherwise the species, um, the species mix will change and therefore the mix of everything else that lives and depends on that forest will change as well. So in that area of uh, New South Wales, 50% of the area was burnt and 81% around um, those, the Blue Mountains area. T tremendous impacts. So what do we know about the megafires' effects on, on insects? Well, the precise effect is very difficult to quantify. No doubt many, many, the countless billions of specimens were, were, um, were, were, were you know, burnt to death in the fires. Um, what we do know about those fires was that normally fire intensity is quite patchy. So often fires will run up, the, uh, the, run up a slope quite quickly and, and be quite intense but then it'll run down the other side of the slope more slowly and not be quite as intense. And often fires that are burning for many days won't be as intense at night time and they won't be as intense in, in Mesic Gully, especially on the southern side of, of, of hillsides. But this time the landscape was so dry, the, the fire intensity was, was great. And the, the severity of the fires meant there was, there was few patches remaining in the landscape that weren't burnt. Insects and other animals and plants, for that matter, normally colonise the fire ground from local unburnt areas. They often don't have to, to um, uh, those surviving populations are, are nearby very often in normal fire seasons and in normal fires. But in this case, the, often there's um, a long way for the colonising populations to move in from the edges of the fires to, to be able to recolonise. So it'll probably take them much longer to recolonize the, the, the fire grounds this time around. Um, many insect species are small and they feed on leaves of plants and because of wind and rain and other things, they often attach themselves very, very securely to their food, to their host plant, and they can't detach very easily at all. They just basically are stuck there for life. So all those species were just um, burnt up by the fires. They couldn't move. Some species um, do hide in burrows in the ground or in tunnels in wood and logs, and many of those will survive. Think ants, many beetles live in holes in the ground. There are many species that can burrow down into the soil and they can survive fires. Um, 
One thing that people often don't think about is the fact that as soon as a fire has been through an area, the next set of rains will uh, wash all the ash into the local watercourses, potentially causing erosion because of the loss of the vegetation cover. But that ash that flows into the streams um, will change the, the chemistry of the water and that will have a negative impact on many of the um, aquatic insect populations in those places as well. Many larger flighted insect species can escape fires um, once they know it's coming um, and if they can out outfly the, the speed of the fire and sometimes this last some of the fires are moving so fast that many things couldn't escape the fire fronts, including humans. Some, of course, in all of these things, there'll be some uh, insect populations that benefit from fires because there'll be many things that are dead in the landscape. So many, uh, many insects feed on dead animal carcasses. I think flies, there are various beetles that do that as well. They'll have minor um, boom times immediately after a fire, but their populations will decline down to background levels once the carcasses have been decomposed in the landscape. Um, we do know in a bit more detail about the fate of some insect species that are listed as rare and threatened. So very often we know about those species uh, uh, more than others because we've had to study their distributions to declare that they're rare and threatened. So we know where that they occur. We know um, what they feed upon. We know uh, the, the times of year when they may be active. And I just wanted to show you some of the species that we know were impacted by the fires last summer in, in a big way. These are just six in insect species that um, were uh, uh, where 30 to 50 percent of their, their total distributions in the landscape overlapped with the burnt area. So it's likely that very large portions of their populations were, were decimated by the fires. So they're, they're often uh, uh, upland species living in living in uh, uh, up in up in the mountains in southeastern yeah. Australia, but not always. So there's the montane iris skipper there on the top left, and going down through eastern brown azures, alpine zenicas, um, the Bathurst copper, one of the uh, one of the real poster children for insect conservation, and the beautiful flame hair root there that was impacted tremendously by the the fires as well. So I suppose in summary for Australian insects, we don't really have a good handle on what the impacts were for, for um, the, of the fires last summer. Uh, but we do know a little bit about um, some of the species that are rare and threatened, either in federal or state legislation. And I think there, there was a list that I've seen of nearly 200 species um, in that legislation or in, in addition that we know a bit about that have, that have probably been affected by the fires to a large extent. One of the really sad and uh, emotionally draining uh, things that I saw in January and February last uh, summer was I kept being sent photographs of, um, I guess, a stranding tide of dead insects on beaches in the south coast of, of, uh, of Australia. And this was a photograph taken by Caitlin Brown at Bermagui just after the fires that impacted the spotted gun forests down around Bermagui. This is really um, uh, the fate of many of the larger flighted insects that try and escape the fire front. In that case, when the fires near the coast, they fly, they fly east out over the ocean um, and they keep flying and eventually they run out of energy and they fall into the water and they die. They, they tend to have uh, air masses in their bodies strongly flighted insects, and they'll just float around their dead and eventually they'll float back up onto the beach. So you get these huge tides of dead, large flighted insects on, on beaches just after fires in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Australia. And that uh, really was um, just for me a demonstration of the huge impact that those fires were having on, on insect biodiversity um, uh, that we really... Uh, really just getting very tiny glimpses of, uh, of what was happening to, to, to insects. These ones that were able to escape but also died, as well as all, all the ones you can imagine could not escape and were just, um, were just consumed by the fire.
Anyway, on that rather um, depressing note, I'll finish my presentation and I'm very happy to take uh, questions. Thank you, David. And we do have a few questions here, so I will uh, I'll go through them and ask you these questions. So the first question we've got is, is there an insect equivalent of the canary in the coal mine that could help us understand potential issues or decline in Australia? Yes, yeah, a good question. A, a one particular species, I don't think so. I think that insects do so many different things. It would be very difficult to 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 hit upon a one particular species that uh, that uh, was uh, was able to be that canary in a coal mine. I think you'd need a suite of species that had different ecological attributes um, that that um, uh, that together could give you some. Some indication of of, uh, of of what was going on. You'd need species that feed on plants, species that say are predators, species that are parasites, species that uh, feed on decomposing leaf litter, species that live in the ground. I mean, you need a, need a suite of different species, I think, in order to really get some sort of a uh, some sort of a um, a measure of what's going on. And as soon as you come up with that list of species, of course, there'll be three other scientists who think it should be a different list so uh, so um, it's uh, often often quite challenging to um, to do those things I'll just flip back am I back on screen now Laverne yes you are good oh no you you're still sharing your screen actually I'll stop sharing and go back to my fly background has it stopped sharing yet yeah good Are there any other questions? Yes, so uh, we've got another couple here. So um, this one, anecdotally, people say ants are increasing in their presence and perhaps species numbers, which could be influenced by global warming. What do we know and what do you think? Ants. Uh, well, now, ants are a good, uh, a good subject uh, for discussion because they're often used in in ecological studies to look at insect populations uh, uh, and there are a lot of ants in Australia. Australia is the land of ants. We may have four or five thousand species of ants in Australia. For some reason ants have done really well in this landscape. Um, perhaps it's because they can cope well with the aridity of most Australian landscapes but there are many many ants here. I haven't heard that they're increasing. I know there have been some studies done recently in central Australia that did not show any declines, and that's what we expect because the factors that we think are impacting insect populations aren't occurring in central mm -hmm. Australia. So we're quite happy that those ants don't appear to be in decline. Um, the other interesting thing about ants is they 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 are um, not very good indicators of the effect of fires because they can scurry down into their holes. They tend not to be in, impacted very much by fires and they live in very large colonies. So if a few workers die, it doesn't really matter. The queen will just lay a bunch more eggs. And of course, once the fire is passed and often, you know, the fires can pass fairly quickly past an ant nest, all the ants uh, immediately rush out of the nest and go and harvest all the dead and dying insects from the surrounding landscape. So often ants can do quite well out of fires. So they're not a particularly good indicator of the general impact of fires on invertebrates. Okay, we've got a, a couple more questions here and I'll, we'll, we'll do those and then we'll move on to uh, Dennis. But uh, another one here, do insects that are increasing perform the same role in ecosystem support as did those that are declining? Uh, or are they having uh, differential effects as suppliers of food, pollination, decomposition, et cetera? It's a good question. And I'd say generally, generally not. What you'll find is that uh, um, uh, those species that are increasing um, will, will generally have less species diversity than, uh, than the ones that were there before. So there'll be so because of that reduced diversity, there'll also be reduced ecological diversity. So you might end up having a lot of a few, a lot more of a few pest species of moth, potentially, say, the landscape that might be um, used to produce cotton. And you might also get some increases in the pests and parasites 
of those of those moths that that uh, consume cotton in that landscape. But you'll tend to get reductions in many many other in natural habitats before those landscapes were modified to produce to produce that crop. So you, you tend to get changes in the um, the uh, ecosystem services provided as the as the species compositions and change and, and the species turn over. I don't know if that's answered that question uh, well or not. <laughs> that's fine. Um, a, a couple more quick ones. There has been a lot of media around the decline of bees around the world recently, aside from the green carpenter bee. Do we know much about what is happening with other Australian bee populations? No, but we do know that uh, definitely in North America, um, uh, be, bees are in decline. There's native bee, a handful of them. Most of them are solitary and just live in live in holes in the ground or in, in dead wood and things. They do a, a tremendous job, that huge diversity of bees pollinating our native plants. The honeybee is an invasive species and it's uh, now, there's very few parts of Australia you can go where there are no feral honeybees. And uh, they, they don't appear to be in decline in Australia yet, but those honeybee populations are definitely in decline in other parts of the world. In fact, North America um, imports a lot of our uh, queen bees in order to repopulate its uh, its honeybee population, especially in California, where honeybees are critical to the pollination of almond crops there. So our honeybee uh, wranglers do quite well out of the declines of honeybees in other parts of the world. Okay, now I've got two more quick questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, just quickly, do apps like iNaturalist help at all in uh, to collect data on insects? Yes, they can do. And uh, I, I think I've said that uh, um, before in, in, in different, uh, on different radio programs that uh, uh, there aren't enough entomologists employed in Australia to study insect populations really and we need a lot of help from citizen scientists. So one way that people can help is by um, using uh, iNaturalist and there are a couple of other apps. There's one specially designed for butterflies. Uh, when you see it, see a butterfly, take a photograph of it, upload it to the uh, upload it to those uh, systems and if you can't identify it, an expert will. And that'll give us much more data on uh, the, the, the population levels of insects and, the, um, and their distribution. So not only butterflies but other groups as well. So that, right. that can help out tremendously. Right. Um, and I'll probably make this one the last one. And I'll get, is it true that the largest diversity of ant species in one place is in Canberra? <laughs> uh, maybe it is. Maybe the largest measured um, uh, diverse population diversity of uh, ants may be in, on Black Mountain here in Canberra. Uh, I Don't quote me, but I think I've heard the ant people tell me that there are more ant species on Black Mountain here in Canberra, which is a very small urban park, really, but it's beautiful woodland. There are more ant species on Black Mountain than, than in the whole of England. <laughs> giving you, just giving you an idea of the, the diversity of ants in Australia. Wherever, wherever you look on the ground in Australia, there will be multiple species of ants foraging. All right, that's great. And I've just got one more quick question here. Generally speaking, do insects respond well to small-scale burning as opposed to large burns, so prescribed burns, for example? Uh, they, uh, prescribed burns um, can often have little impact upon insect populations. Again, if the scale of them is, is, is small, sort of spatially or geographically, and if they're not tremendously hot burns, and if they're done at the right time of year. If they're, if they're potentially done in winter when many insects are in a, a resting phase, either eggs or, or, or pupae that may be concealed somewhere in the environment, those, those cool prescribed burns can have, can have not very much impact upon insect populations. But unfortunately, the megafires occurred in the mid, middle of summer 
then most insect populations are in their adult phases when they're not concealing themselves, when they're out feeding and reproducing, and they're really vulnerable to, uh, to fire. Okay. But up there so we can move on to our next speaker. But thank you very much, David, for giving us your time today. It's much appreciated. I ask everyone to applause virtually. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it was uh, that was fascinating. And look, you know, a couple of takeouts, quick takeouts from me. Um, we obviously need to get more data on uh, on insects. Um, insects desperately need a good PR company, and um, I would suggest they use the chocolate uh, uh, <laughs> line there. That might help. So uh, thank you very much, David. Much appreciated. Well, thanks, Alberta. It's been great to have the opportunity to talk to your audience. Thank you. All right, everyone, we'll move on to our next speaker now, uh, Dennis Crawford, who is probably quite well known to a lot of you. I know uh, Dennis speaks on ABC Radio um, Statewide Drive, I think, on a regular basis, weekly, I think, isn't it? And uh, and he's also right. produced a couple of books, which I'll hold up here because I've got them in my library. So, And, of course, they're all back to front, aren't they? Um, but they're great books. Um, Dennis has a background in agricultural etymology and entomology, sorry, and uh, scientific photography. He has been working with insect, insects for nearly 40 years, either as a researcher, writer, photographer, or pest management consultant. So I will hand over to you now, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'm hoping I, I can't actually see my... Oh, here we go. Lovely. My uh, talk is being run by somebody else, so you'll uh, have to bear with me. So, um, David is very uh, for my uh, for my talk. Um, and so he's covered, you know, insect decline and why it matters and looking at uh, bushfires in particular. And so it's made my job... Uh, much easier if we could move to the next slide, please. And some of the reasons behind um, insect decline, David's already covered, but uh, habitat loss is uh, kind of on the uh, on the list. And I'm just fiddling with my screen here to make it larger. Um, and uh, David has suggested, of course, that megafires is one of those reasons behind habitat loss, but it could be also much more um, direct uh, human intervention. So things like forestry and agriculture and, and mining and so forth. So baby, basically, you know, chopping start the trees down and digging stuff up. It doesn't really do um, the environment any good and especially our, um, our insects. Um, chemical use is also one of the uh, reasons listed for some of these declines. Um, insecticides is fairly obvious. Um, but also, if you think about the impact that uh, chemical fertilisers can have on the insects that dwell in the soil, uh, none of this is very good. Um, and urbanisation and industrialisation, of course, pushes these factors even further. Um, so you need you need to uh, chop more trees down and dig more stuff up to build more cities to house more people, and then you have other factors um, being involved like uh, water pollution, air pollution, and so forth, and things just get uh, worse from there. Um, introduced species um, is another factor, and it's um, possibly. Uh, not something that would spring to mind straight away, um, but I'll give you a, a couple of examples uh, very shortly. Um, and then the big elephant in the room, of course, is climate change, which then makes everything else um, even worse. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, not seeing that. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just give an example of how an exotic species can affect another species. So this is a tale of two bumblebees. So the amazing creature on the left is the largest bumblebee in the world. 
Bombus dalvomii, and um, it lives in South America in the foothills of the Andes in countries like uh, Chile and Argentina. Uh, the in insect is so big that the locals refer to it as the flying mouse. On the other side, we have one of the European bubble bees known as Bombus terrestris. Now, Bombus terrestris is well known in Europe and uh, other parts of the world as a very efficient pollinator of glasshouse crops, especially tomatoes. And so when the farmers of um, the Andean region in Chile and um, Argentina decided to grow tomatoes, they started growing them in glasshouses. They heard about this bumblebee in Europe and they decided to import it. And they imported them in the millions, and I've, I believe from Belgium. And so what could possibly go wrong? Well, they escaped, of course. Now you would think, now how can one bee affect another bee, especially this bee, this biggest of all bumblebees? Well, it wasn't the bumblebees themselves, the exotic bumblebees, it was what they were carrying. They were carrying pathogens that Bombus dalvomii had no defence against, and their populations collapsed to the point that they are on the brink of extinction. Will they go extinct? We don't know, but they have certainly declined significantly. If we could go on to the next slide, please. And so this is a, a possible local example of this, of an exotic species affecting a native species. I'm often asked about the emperor gum moth and why it has declined in Western Victoria. Now, of course, that decline is only anecdotal because as David has suggested, only a few insects have actually been studied long enough for us to know whether they have actually declined. But certainly anecdotally, the emperor gum moth has declined in Western Victoria. And one of the reasons suggested for that decline is the introduction of the European wasp. And the European wasp um, is very aggressive and it is also very well known for carting off caterpillars, i.e. the larvae of various moths and butterflies, including those of the emperor gum moth. So it is possible that this is an example of how an introduced species can um, influence uh, the population of a native moth. Um, there are possibly other factors involved, including habitat loss and including things like um, the populations of emperor gum moth larvae tend to be skewed towards young, younger leaves of eucalypts and usually younger plants. So, and of course, in plantations and so forth, the, um, the trees are all the same age. If we could go on to the next slide, please. So we're talking about, you know, why it matters. You know, why does it matter if the insects disappear? Well, let's just look at, for a little while, what makes insects so special. Insects are found on every continent on Earth, yes, including Antarctica. Well, there's only one species, I think, but it's there. And they are found in most terrestrial habitats. Um, we have somewhere between one and five million species of insects throughout the world. Um, as David has suggested, we don't really know how many because there aren't enough entomologists or taxonomists. Um, but there's lots. And if to put it into perspective, I think the total number of mammal species on Earth is about five and a half thousand, somewhere there, compared to five million. So there are lots of different species. Therefore, that means they are very diverse. Insects have also been on Earth for a very long time, roughly about 400 million years. We don't really know exactly how many million years. And um, you know, we just, I uh, so beg your pardon, something really weird has happened there. Never mind, I shall fix that. And because of their um, insects have been found on every continent, because there are so many of them, because they've been around for so long, 
they underpin most terrestrial ecosystems. Next slide, please. And so, yeah, the system's just struggling a little bit, but never mind. Uh, I'm not seeing the change, but I'll carry on as if it has changed. So, because of their ubiquity and biodiversity and longevity and so forth, they are vital within the, our, the ecosystems within which they occur. And David has already covered some of this, and what I get to do is to show you some examples. So pollination is a really obvious thing that um, insects do. It's kind of the first thing that people learn about what an insect does, but of course it's only some of the insects. Um, and seed dispersal is another very important um, service that insects perform, and I'll explain that shortly. Um, decomposition, of course, you only have to think about dung burial and stuff like that. Uh, population control, that's insects feeding on each other or parasitising each other. Um, insects being food for other animals and insects aerating soil while digging their nests. Um, next slide, please. Is a very important thing. So, I've, look, I could have put so many different insects up here. So, I've just picked a few locals so that um, things that you can perhaps you're not quite as familiar with. Um, David's already mentioned that we have, you know, at least 1,500 species. There's one in the image on the top left there. And so they, of course, are part of the suite of animals that uh, pollinated all our plants, all our native plants, before we introduced the honeybee. Um, on the right, we have some flies that have sprung into life over the last couple of weeks. And on a day like today, if you go outside and find a, a flowering shrub, um, particularly a native one with lots of small flowers, say something like a thryptamine bush, you would find lots of hoverflies um, flying around the plants. So with these flies, you get a couple of ecological services in one because the adults are pollinators and their larvae are predators of other insects. So soft-bodied things, you know, like aphids and uh, little leaf hoppers and so forth. In the bottom right hand corner, we have. Sorry, um, excuse me, Dennis. I'm just yes. going to interrupt for a second. If, could you turn off your video so that we can uh, improve your audio? It's just a little bit glitchy at times. Certainly. Okay, so camera's off. And uh, yeah, so the insect in the bottom left hand corner there is a hairy flower wasp. Um, Hairy flower wasps are in one family of, of wasps. There's another a family of wasps called uh, flower wasps. So it all gets very confusing, but they kind of do the same thing. Um, and especially these hairy ones, they kind of go nuts when they land in one of these bottle brush type flowers and sort of roll around in it. Um, and obviously are having a really great time. And they're very hairy, pick up lots of pollen, move to another flower and hence pollination. Now, this is another group of insects where you get a couple of services in one. The females of these wasps are parasites of some of the insects uh, which live underground. So it could be things like um, the grubs of certain beetles, the larvae of certain beetles, um, or other insects like um, mole crickets. So they are terrific in the environment. Next slide, please. Seed dispersal. Now, I'll just spend a little bit of um, time on this because some of you would be familiar with this and others wouldn't. So there's a couple of pictures here and I'll, I'll go over it. So on the top left, we have a, a small ant. Um, it's about six or seven millimetres in length. This is the green head ant. It's very common in our area in Western Victoria. It is one of the ants known to be involved in seed dispersal. And there's a whole 
um, science around this, uh, known as Mimiko Kori, the, the uh, seed dispersal by ants. And so on the top right, you have an image of some wattle seeds. And the seed is the black part, and that sort of creamy coloured um, part is known as an eliosome. And the eliosome is sort of a soft, um, fatty tissue kind of thing, which is very attractive to ants. So the ants come along and they pick up the whole seed, including the eliosome, take it back into their nest. They feed on the eliosome because they like that. That's nice and fatty and yummy to an ant. And they discard the seed because the seed is too hard. We don't want to chew that way and you want the other bit. And so they put that seed, depending on the species of ants involved, either in a rubbish dump area, actually in the nest or outside the nest, or they might simply just um, take it out of the nest and shove it under some bark or some leaf litter or something like that, effectively planting the seed. And so the whole idea of seed dispersal generally is about the parent plant, so in this case, a wattle tree, wanting to have its seeds moved away from it, from the parent. So if the seeds all germinate, they're not competing with each other and they're not competing with the parent plant. And so there's about, uh, I think, oh, something a bit under 2,000 species of native um, plants that have evolved in this way, that have eliosomes on their seed um, to aid in the dispersal of those seeds by ants. Now, the story doesn't end there. Down the bottom, what looks like seeds, those three little brown things there, aren't seeds at all. They are the eggs of a stick insect. And on those eggs is a little fatty body, just like on the seeds above that had the eliosome that's got this little fatty body. I think in this case now, now being into entomology, we've changed the name to a capitulum, I think, off the top of my head. And it's a fatty body attractive to ants. So the ants come along and they pick up the eggs and they take the eggs into their nest, they eat the little fatty body and discard the egg or whatever the hell they think it is down the back into the rubbish tip. And now the stick insect eggs are now protected underground by an army of ants. Then the egg hatches. At this stage, the tiny little stick insect nymph looks like an ant and more importantly, kind of smells like an ant. It's giving off all the right chemical cues so it's not attacked by the ants. And the little stick insect goes great, walks out of the ant nest up the nearest gum tree and starts feeding on the gum tree leaves because that's what stick insects do. Next slide, please. David's already touched on the, uh, the decomposition cycle or the insect decomposes. So I'll just look at a couple of locals. Um, we have our own local um, dung beetles. That's one of the species in the top left-hand corner there. And of course, they evolve to deal with the dung of uh, macropods, uh, which are uh, fairly small and uh, much drier and uh, more fibrous than um, cow pats, for example. Um, but we certainly have our own. And these are quite large beetles that uh, smash in, into my windows at night uh, where I live here in the Grampians. And so they do a fabulous um, ecosystem service by helping to take um, the dung of animals underground. I'm sure they breed in it, but a whole lot of it um, ends up eventually um, in the soil um, as fertiliser for plants and so forth. So it's part of all that, that whole cycle of nutrients. On the right-hand side, we have another example often much maligned insects, because these are what people know as borers. There's several families of beetles involved that do this. This is just one. Um, you'd be quite familiar with some of these beetles, certainly people that live out here, because we've got some fairly spectacular species that have very, very long antennae, and their grubs have very powerful jaws 
and are able to chew through wood. They are sort of heavily involved. Um, they and the jewel beetles are heavily involved in the cycle of life uh, for plants like wattles. As we know, they often don't uh, live very long, uh, wattle plants. And so these guys help to break them down. And once again, it's all part of that nutrient cycle. Um, sure, there are other um, insects and other, other creatures that help to break down wood, but this is one of them and a fairly important one. Now, I'd also like to give a vote for blowflies. More uh, heavily maligned animals um, tend to annoy people because of their buzzing and they must be bad, you know, because they're big and hairy and a little bit scary. But once again, these guys um, perform great ecosystem services, a couple of them. They're big flies, they're very hairy, they feed on nectar, so they are very efficient pollinators. The larvae are well known decomposers of the dead bodies of animals. So they're carrion feeders. So that once again, the nutrient cycle, they're helping to turn dead, dead animals, basically the nutrients that go into the soil. So great service uh, providers. Next slide, please. Uh, David's touched on this. And once again, I could have put up all sorts of insects, you know, like ladybirds and lace, tree beetles and parasitic wasps of various kinds and predatory bugs and you, you name it. There's, there's so many that do this. I just chose a couple of locals. Um, on the left, a potter wasp, a very common um, wasp around here uh, that builds these sort of um, dome type uh, cells and eventually joins a few together and then smothers it all with um, mud and people don't like them on the side of their houses. I reckon they're fantastic. And each one of these cells, like this female wasp is looking into here, she puts about 10 large, quite large caterpillars. I've watched them doing it. And then she lays an egg, seals up the nest, uh, that nest cell. And um, when the wasp larva hatches, it's got plenty of food. So certainly um, in a garden or a, a crop or something like that, they're per performing a really good thing because they're helping to um, control the number of caterpillars on plants. So they're fantastic to have around. On the right hand side, we've got another very common local, uh, Lysipimpla excelsa, which is um, known as the orchid dupe. The female is a well-known uh, parasite of very large caterpillars, some of which are major agricultural and uh, horticultural pests. And the male wasp is a pollinator, in fact, the sole pollinator of the cryptostylus group of native orchids. And how that works is a rather amazing thing known as pseudocopulation and deception where the flower deceives the male into thinking that it's a female wasp because the flower is giving off the same pheromone that the female wasp gives off. And so there's a picture of a male thinking it's mating with a wasp, but it's actually pollinating a flower. So if we kind of close that loop, without the caterpillars, the wasps wouldn't exist because the wasps breed in the caterpillars. Therefore, if you didn't have the caterpillars, you wouldn't have the uh, cryptostylus orchids because these are the only wasps which um, pollinate them. Uh, next slide, please. Insects as food, of course, is um, important within uh, the environment. There was a paper that came out um, two or three years ago now, I can't remember off the top of my head about, uh, with spiders in particular, the colossal tonnage of insects that spiders feed on. Um, all spiders are predators. Therefore, all spiders are good. Um, so there's your little ecosystem working quite well, as if you've got lots of spiders, um, it's, a, it's a good thing. 
Um, on the right, that's just one of many examples of birds which feed on um, insects. This uh, little spotted pardalote um, is well known for feeding on the psyllid insects, which are under those little white uh, lerp things that appear on gum tree leaves. It's a very common thing um, in our area. But of course, there are a vast number of other birds, um, fish and, um, and mammals that rely um, on insects as food. So next slide, please. We have the earth movers as well, as I mentioned before about um, insects are helping to aerate soil um, while they dig their nests. On the left, we have an example of a, a local termite mound. Sure, they're not the great big exotic things like they have up in the Northern Territory, um, but this one's about um, hip height on me. Um, and so it contains lots and lots of termites. Um, but you've kind of got a couple of things happening here. You've got earth movement, and you can also see a, a great big hole at the top of the termite mound. Now, that's the activity of echidnids, which then feeds back into what we were just talking about, about insects as food. Um, on the right, we can see a couple of ant species um, just near their uh, nest holes. Um, you see lots of ant activity after rain um, because the rain washes bits of dirt into their nest holes and they spend the morning um, getting all that dirt out and um, patrolling backwards and forwards and making it all clean. And so they end up moving a whole lot of dirt, even, even small ants and uh, small colonies. But down the, the bottom image there, it should be very familiar to you, um, that's the meat ant. Now they have very large colonies. You could have a quite a large nest, you know, here and then 10 meters away, another nest, and then 50 meters, another nest. Quite often they're all related and all connected. So when they're out and about moving lots of uh, soil and so forth and digging um, and moving those little pebbles that they do, that's a whole lot of um, movement of earth. And on YouTube, you can see videos of people pouring um, various substances, sometimes molten metal, um, sometimes a kind of a latex stuff down ant nests and letting it cool and then uh, digging it up. And you can see like a cast of the ant nest. And that gives you an idea sometimes of how deep these nests are and how many galleries that these nests have and you get an idea of how much earth they've had to move um, to make that nest. In some parts of the world and including here in um, arid zones, it is said that the, um, the earth move works of um, ants and termites replaces that of um, earthworms, for example, because you know the soil is much drier and is not so attractive um, to earthworms. And we know here in the Wimmera about how some of our local uh, earthworm species uh, move up and down in the um, soil column, depending on where the water table is. They, you, you, some of them are hard to find in summer. They're a long way down. And so they don't like um, uh, dry soil. So the ants do and the termites do all that work. Uh, next slide, please. So to so kind of bring it all home, um, if you look at a world without insects, what would that be like? You know, we don't know, as David was saying, we really don't know, um, you know, how, how much the insects are declining. We don't know um, how much insects would have to decline before the, you know, the ecosystems would collapse, but we know it wouldn't be good. And, and we know um, we really need the insects. So without insects, you'd have less flowering plants, you know, all the gum trees would eventually die off as, you know, there'd be no recruitment. There'd be less fish and bats and other mammals and birds that rely on insects. And then, you know, the ones that eat those would start to die out. There'd be organic waste everywhere. The trees would fall over and stay there, et cetera. Um, you, you know, you'd be dung a mile high and all the rest of it. All the things that insects do for us directly, such as silk and honey and cochineal and all those things, they disappear. Uh, the effect on agriculture and horticulture would be devastating. 
And what would happen then, we don't really know. And I often quote um, Sir David Attenborough around about now when I do talks like this, and he said something along the lines of, if we and the other vertebrates, as in the other backboned animals, were to disappear off the planet, the rest of all the living creatures out there would go, oh, yes, so what? And carry on. Well, they might heave a sigh of, sigh of relief as well. But if the invertebrates and a great part of those, great proportion of those, are the insects, if they disappeared, most terrestrial ecosystems would collapse. Next slide, please. I'd like to finish with a little story. And this will kind of uh, bring it home as to what I think about it, you know, my personal view on all this. We have a butterfly and we have an ant. And this is the southern purple azure butterfly. Um, and David mentioned one of the azure butterflies was uh, threatened by the bushfires uh, that he outlined before. And um, this uh, is out in Western Victoria and also spreads into South Australia. And, but the story really starts with a gum tree. And on that gum tree is a mistletoe. And on the mistletoe, the caterpillars, the larvae of this butterfly feed. And as they feed, they are protected by the ant, the banded sugar ant. And this all happens at night. And so, because the ant is nocturnal. And then at daybreak, what happens is the ants herd or assist the caterpillars down out of the tree. And then they uh, look after them during the day. And so the larvae are protected by the ants during the day. Now, why does that happen? What do the caterpillars get out of it? What do the ants get out of it? Well, the caterpillars have the protection, of course, of the ants. And the ants get sweet honeydew, which comes out of a gland, a special gland on the caterpillars. And so it's a fabulous story. And that's happening out there in the trees around me right now, um, because I know this butterfly is on the property that I'm living on. I know the ants are here. It's just unfortunately the mistletoe is way up the tree, so I can't see it all happening. And so it kind of, well, let's just have the next slide. That's why insects are just simply awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. That was excellent presentation. Um, Thank you. Now, we do have, I've got a question here, and we might get some more yet, so I'll read this one out. Um, this is from, uh, well, I once I once experienced uh, six plus different species of ants in the Grampians release new queens from their homes at once. It was extraordinary as it was synchronised across 20 minutes, then all, then all over. What cue could have been at play that triggered this? Yeah, that'd be atmospheric. Some of them, um, it's um, just basically air pressure is 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 the thing. So the um, as <clears throat> and humidity, and so there's certain species of moths that do the same thing, and so uh, and also time of day um, so, um, when the ants fly, um, they tend to be towards the end of the day. So it's sort of usually fairly still, um, it's still warm, um, and it's quite often uh, fairly fairly humid, but uh, certainly not dry. So that would probably uh, is what triggered that. Okay. Um, if there are any other questions, please put them up now. Um, and uh, first of all, uh, also, Dennis, I'd like to thank you for uh, what was a terrific presentation there. We did uh, we did have a few glitches with your um, uh, audio, um, and when we got you to turn off the video, it was uh, it was much better. Uh, so that was um, easy. I'm right. just seeing if there's um, some more questions here now. 
Okay. What inter sorry. What interesting insect observations do you have this have you had this year? Oh gosh, that's a good question. I, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that one. Um, well, I'll give you a chance to think of it. Yeah, while I, think I, about yeah, it. I like. Yeah, so I like to um, always find, uh, and so I um, I start looking um, around about now, and often I'm drawn to um, you know flowering plants because so many things here, and so at this year I'm trying to um, catalog all of the the native bees that I have here because there's um, multiple species. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes when I see them, um, it's fleeting and I don't know what they are because I don't get a good look at them and I haven't had time to, to photograph them. But certainly um, native bees are top of my list um, at the moment. Okay. Now, I do have some other questions now. Uh, green blowflies, what are they? Yeah, well, they may not be blowflies. So the, they are most likely... Um, a tachinid fly um, in the, uh, the genus Rutilia. Uh, so it's green moth fly, they're usually, um, and when they fly, they have a uh, quite a, a distinctive drone sound. Um, and so they are actually a really good thing to have around um, because they are a parasite. Um, of various other insects, so they're, they're awesome. And to have them uh, around, uh, don't worry, <laughs> they're all good. Okay, I've got uh, some more questions here. What role do mosquitoes play in the ecosystem? I think most of us think they're just pests, but um, yeah. there's obviously something. Yeah, I think David might have already covered this because, um, yeah, they, they are... Uh, filter feeders for a start as, their, as larvae. They are food for um, uh, aquatic creatures. Um, they are also, and in the adult form, they are also food for lots of animals. So all of the insectivorous things. Um, I can tell you of a, a time, one time when I was sleeping in some um, sand dunes at night. Um, I don't ask why anyway. Um, I'll just carry on as if you hadn't noticed that. Um, so the, I was sitting there sort of um, watching the last of the light at night and then watching the stars, and I had these mosquitoes flying around my ears. And then the mosquitoes disappeared because little insectivorous bats um, flew out of the bush and started uh, feeding on all the, all the mosquitoes. So, so if I sat still... The bats were quite happy to clean them up for me. So they, every insect, uh, you know, has um, a good a good reason to live. Okay, we've got a few more questions here. Um, and look, I'll just remind everyone very briefly, the, uh, if you've got access to the chat, the um, survey monkey is on there as well, if you want to click on that at the before we finish today. So next question for you, Dennis, uh, what apps, do you use for insect ID? Uh, I well, I kind of bypass the apps because I know I know quite a few um, entom uh, entomological specialists and ta taxonomists. So uh, I usually send um, images and/or specimens directly to them because I know who they are. So I kind of cheat. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, what is your photography process? How long on average does it take to photograph one insect? Uh, depends what it is. It can take days, if not weeks, um, to actually find them um, and to work, sometimes work out a particular technique uh, to photograph them. Uh, for example, I spent a whole lot of time um, earlier this year dealing with citrus gall wasp which is a, um, a tiny insect, uh, two to three millimetres in length as an adult, and I wanted to uh, get some uh, great photographs of them. Um, and, you know, they're, they're small, outside, so I had to, um, then, of course, they've got to be alive and running around, and 
uh, I had to work out a, uh, a, a kind of a special way to light them with my flashes um, so that I could see the fine detail in them um, because usually if you use a large flash on a, a shiny insect, you kind of lose all the detail on the surface. All you see um, is reflection. Um, so it can take some time and there's often uh, different techniques for different insects and sometimes you have to invent a new one um, when you've got uh, something that is um, you know, particularly really small and really shiny insects. So I think the key word there is patience. <laughs> very very um, much so. It's, it's essential. So some more questions. How many other species have a similar relationship between ant and butterfly larvae? We know it occurs with at least one of the coppers, but I have read about uh, similar in New South Wales too. Uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of, um, of uh, butterfly larvae uh, that do this uh, in the Lysenid family. Um, I'll point you to a really great resource um, online that um, comes out of the uh, Butterfly Conservation Group of South Australia. They have a, a really good website. Um, just Google that and you'll find it. Um, and they have all of these stories um, you know, really well documented uh, with photographs. Um, and many of those stories apply here in Western Victoria um, because we have um, similar fauna. Okay, another question. I often wondered whether flies were really important at eating poo too. They fly, they fly off wallaby poo all the time. Is that true? You carry it off. Uh, yeah, so there's a, quite a few flies that do that breed in um, the breed in and dung of, of various sorts. Um, of course, the most common one of those is uh, the Australian bush fly, the one that is um, gives us our a great Australian salute. Um, and so, um, you know, for example, um, you know, back in the day when I worked uh, full time for the Department of Agriculture, did some work um, in alliance with CSIRO releasing dung beetles um, in uh, Western Gippsland. Um, and so the thing that we were trying to do was to uh, remove uh, the cow pets out of the paddock um, because the bushfire populations, um, as, as cow herds got bigger, especially in the higher rainfall areas, um, at certain times of the year, the consistency of the cow pet was just perfect for breeding large numbers of flies. So um, it's a great example of biological control. Um, you know, we could introduce another, another insect to take care of the cow pet, which in turn then took care of um, a high percentage of the bush flies. Of course, we weren't trying to eradicate the bush flies, we were just trying to reduce their numbers down um, to a level that you know, people could handle. <laughs> Fair enough. Look, we might wrap up the questions there and I'll um, just like to thank both uh, Dennis and David for giving us uh, an hour and a half of, of terrific presentations on, uh, on those little things, insects. I guess you know why do why do insect matters insects matter? I think we've heard a lot of good reasons today. They're everywhere. There's a one between one and five million species. They're very diverse. There's um, um, they've been around for a very very long time, um, and they they underpin most terrestrial ecosystems. And I also have to say they they in, they're in they're found in one of my favourite gins, green ant gin. So. Um, and, uh, and they're becoming an economic resource as well as uh, black soldier flies are being used to deal with food waste. So there's uh, a lot of different uh, reasons why we want and need insects. And uh, yes, perhaps they just need a good PR firm. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming and attending today. Some great questions there. And uh, remind you all that uh, we have another session at the same time ne next week. Uh, so keep an eye out on our Facebook page for that. If you haven't registered, 
feel free to register. Um, just to let you know, uh, Dennis and David, if you're still there, there's a lot of love on the chat room there for you. So great presentation, great images, and um, we very much enjoyed, uh, enjoyed it today. And uh, if you can do the survey, please do so. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Lynn.